Control questioned. Criticism mounts as a second nurse in Dallas is diagnosed with Ebola. Wild ride. Stocks post a roller coaster day as investors digest ominous economic news. Pro-life law blocked. The Supreme Court stops Texas from implementing a law that would have closed abortion clinics. And jack-o'-lantern sun. Active regions of the sun combined to create a fascinating image earlier this month. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, October 15th, 2014. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick, a second American hospital worker who helped care for an Ebola patient from Liberia now has that disease. There's mounting criticism tonight and questions about how the outbreak is being handled here in the U.S. Our chief White House correspondent Suzanne LaFranchi has the story tonight. Suzanne. Good evening, Brian. Uh, right now at this hour, Obama, the president, continues to meet with his cabinet over this unfolding crisis. Uh, the meeting is closed to the press, but the president is expected to say to make some remarks afterwards. So we're waiting for that. In an unusual move, the president also canceled a scheduled campaign trip to Connecticut as the questions continue to rise over this unfolding crisis. The White House today reiterated the president's reassurances that an Ebola epidemic in the United States is highly unlikely. It is true. It's guided by the science. That's what our experts say. Uh, our experts say that because the way that Ebola is transmitted uh, is very clear and is something that is not likely uh, to happen in the United States. The CDC says the virus is not contagious until a person starts showing symptoms and the likelihood of it being passed on an airplane is extremely low. A second health care worker identified as 29-year-old nurse Amber Joy Vizen, who, like her 26-year-old co-worker Nina Pham, had close contact with Thomas Duncan, the Liberian man, the first Ebola patient diagnosed in the United States, who died earlier this month. This morning, police and hazmat workers began decontaminating Vizen's apartment. Dr. Tom Frieden, head of the CDC, has acknowledged that the government was not aggressive enough in managing the Ebola cases. But late this afternoon in a teleconference call with reporters, he said new protocols are in place. We have now ensured that 24-7 there will be a site manager who will monitor how personal protective equipment is put on, taken off, and what's done when people are in it. One medical union, the National Nurses United, says nurses at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital were simply not properly prepared for cases like this. Having healthcare workers get infected is not acceptable. Dr. Amesh Adalja believes the CDC should designate specialized infectious disease hospitals to treat Ebola patients. We know that those places are adept at taking care of critical, critically ill patients, that they do have a lot of patients in isolation, and they, that may be much easier to handle and to uh, minimize the risk to healthcare workers. There is some good news tonight, Brian. Uh, Nina Pham is said to be improving. And as far as Amber Joy Vizen is concerned, she flew to Cleveland to plan her wedding. Uh, the other latest we're hearing is that she is going to be transferred to Emory University Hospital for treatment. Back to you, Brian. All right, Suzanne LaFranchi at the White House tonight. Thank you. And news that the latest Ebola victim flew on a commercial flight sent airline stocks tumbling this afternoon. Investors worried that fears about the virus could cause travelers to avoid flying. Shares of the largest U.S. airlines fell by 2 to 4 percent today. And investors overall had a wild ride on Wall Street with the Dow falling more than 450 points at one point. Now, at the close, the Dow was down 173 points or 1.1 percent to 16,141. The S&P 500 fell 15 points to 1862. And the Nasdaq was off 11 points to 42,15. And now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. The U.S. Supreme Court has temporarily blocked key parts of a 2013 law that closed all but eight abortion clinics in Texas. That law requires abortion providers to upgrade their facilities to the level of surgical centers. Jason Calvi is here now with that story tonight. Brian, the great debate on abortion and the high court sided with abortion supporters, at least for now. The court has also put on hold a part of the law requiring abortion doctors to have admitting privileges in El Paso and McAllen. That part of the law remains in effect elsewhere in Texas. The Supreme Court issued the 6-3 order last night. 
Pro-life activists in Texas are reacting today to the high court's decision. Tens of thousands of abortions will be again performed in a manner that really puts the, the health and safety of women undergoing abortion at risk. Uh, from the point of the pro-life groups, we are all very disappointed. Justices Alito, Scalia and Thomas said they would have ruled against the abortion clinics. It's the first time in 22 years Justice Kennedy cast a vote in support of abortion. According to constitutional expert Ian Milhisser, he says one problem is the law applies to clinics that only distribute abortion-inducing drugs. If this were a health regulation, then the way it's written doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to say that we're going to regulate you like you're performing surgeries when all you're doing is giving a woman a pill. The Supreme Court has said, for example, that when a law creates a substantial obstacle to women obtaining an abortion, that's not allowed. The Texas Alliance for Life says they disagree. And the Supreme Court does allow states to ensure that abortions are not done in a manner that puts the safety of women at risk. That's what House Bill 2 is all about. The fight over the Texas law is the latest in a series of skirmishes over restrictions on abortion across the country. In just the last couple of years, 200 pieces of pro-life legislation have passed around the country. That is a springtime for the pro-life movement. The Susan B. Anthony list is urging voters to elect pro-life candidates to the Senate in November in order to pass a law banning abortion after 20 weeks. 3,800 children who die every single day. And we're very, very close to saving 15,000 children every year. Very close. That's what the pain capable bill would do. And the Texas law bans abortions after 20 weeks as well. And that stays in place. The ruling by the Supreme Court is just temporary. An appeals court is still reviewing whether the Texas law is constitutional. And after that, the case could end up once again at the high court. Brian? All right, Jason, and a little bit later, we'll speak with a filmmaker on what he's discovered about today's pro-life movement that's coming up. A Minnesota nurse will serve less than 200 days in jail for encouraging two people to commit suicide. William Melkert Dinkle was sentenced to three years in prison. He won't have to serve the full term, though, if he complies with probation rules. He was convicted in September of assisting suicide and a second count of attempting to assist suicide. The case is legally tricky because Minnesota changed its laws about assisted suicide while this case was being heard. Under the current law, it's illegal to assist a suicide, but not illegal to encourage suicide. In court today, Melkert Dinkle apologized for his actions. Pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong are expressing outrage tonight, accusing police of brutality. Hundreds gathered tonight outside police headquarters. They're angry about what they're calling aggressive tactics used by law enforcement. Six police officers have been reassigned after cameras allegedly showed an activist being kicked and beaten. The protesters have filled the streets of Hong Kong for more than two weeks now, demanding free elections. Hundreds of African migrants tried to scale a fence into Spanish territory today. This dramatic video shows about 300 migrants attempting to scale the 20-foot high fence all at the same time. This happened just outside Morocco, where Spain still has a small territory. Spanish officials say five police officers and five migrants were injured. African migrants often try to enter enclaves like this as a stepping stone into Europe. Kurdish fighters are making progress against Sunni militants in Kobani with a lot of help from stepped-up coalition airstrikes. The Kurds are fighting street battles against the extremists, making small advances trying to defend the Syrian border town. The progress comes hours after the Pentagon conducted 21 airstrikes against ISIS targets near Kobani, but the Pentagon says the fight is far from over. It's important for people to understand Kobani could still fall. It could very well still fall. This was the most intensive assault since the air campaign started. The U.S. is also striking oil facilities, hoping to cut off a major source of income for the Islamic State. Well, the Pentagon announces the name of its air campaign against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. It will be called Operation Inherent Resolve. Military operations are usually given official names that convey a message. For instance, the U.S.-led war in Afghanistan was dubbed Operation Enduring Freedom. The U.S. has more than 1,400 military personnel involved in the campaign in Iraq, but none in Syria. Coming up, we talk with a laywoman who is in Rome about what is and isn't being discussed at the Synod on the Family.
On this Wednesday, October the 15th, we celebrate St. Teresa of Avila, a Carmelite, a doctor of the church, a contemplative and reformer from the 16th century. One of her many famous quotes, let nothing disturb you, let nothing frighten you. Everything passes away except God. Kim Daniels with Catholic Voices USA joining us from Rome where the Synod on the Family is now in its second week. Kim, I know you are familiar with many of the American bishops having worked for the USCCB. What are you hearing from them and what is your take on the Synod discussion so far? Well, I'm excited and encouraged by what's happening here in Rome right now. I think what you're hearing as a common thread throughout all of these discussions is the bishops affirming the goodness and truth and beauty of Catholic teachings on marriage and family life. I'm the mom of six kids. I've been married for over 20 years, and I know those teachings have been a real strength for us and a real gift. And I'm just glad the bishops are working hard to bring those teachings to as many people as we can. So as a, a working mom, a professional, uh, what are the most important issues that have come up for discussion in your mind? Sure. One thing that, again, keeps being talked about and is flying a little bit under the radar here is the bishop's effort to bolster practical support for families. Now, the church already does so much in our parishes, in our schools, where we educate over 2 million kids, through Catholic charities and other groups where we provide food and clothing and shelter to needy families, but also direct family services. But as you know, marriage is in somewhat of a struggle right now, and it's great that the bishops are trying to bolster those practical efforts to help people. And I think that's going to be a very important result of this synod. Well, this synod is certainly drawing more attention than many of the synods that has preceded this one sure. for different reasons. What has struck you as most interesting about this synod? I've actually been struck by what's not being talked about, and I'll mention two things. The first is the theology of the body. As many of us know, St. John Paul II gave this great gift to the church with his teachings, with the development of his teachings on marriage and family life, and I think it would be wonderful for our church to think about how best to implement those. And the second subject that hasn't come up as much as I thought it would, although it has come up, are the economic pressures that are facing families around the world and what we can do to help families face those pressures. All right, Kim Daniels, you're with Catholic Voices USA. Why are you and Catholic Voices there at this synod? We're here because this is a synod about family life, and this is a synod that means for the lady. And Catholic Voices is about the lady making the church's case in the public square as lay people who know and love our faith. So we're here to support our bishops, and we're here to help make that case. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's really good to have you, and I just finally want to ask you, what you think will be the final outcome of this week compared with last week, which was a bit uh, controversial in many areas. Do you think that the final report is going to really change dramatically from the midterm? Well, I know that the bishops have been working on it in these small discussion groups, and they wouldn't be having these small groups if they weren't going to be working on the document and making some changes. So I know that that was an interim report, and we should expect some changes from it. At the same time, I know that it's a working document that will be discussed throughout the year, and the real real uh, effort and work and decisions on this come next year at this time. Yeah, that's a great reminder to all of us. Kim Daniels with Catholic Voices USA joining us from Rome tonight. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. And while some are interpreting the Synod's midterm report as a dramatic shift for the church on homosexuality, a prominent American cardinal offers a clarification tonight. Every person has a dignity all of their own, a worth, a value, a God-given dignity. And a person, a homosexual person, a person who has this orientation, has the dignity of, of being who they are. And so the church is simply recognizing that and saying it today in a way that perhaps is being better heard. And Eve Tushnet, a Catholic celibate who is gay, wrote for the National Catholic Register and has a new book called Gay and Catholic. She believes there is a place for gay people in the Catholic Church. There's actually a huge range of possible ways for gay people to live out lives of love and fruitfulness within the Catholic Church. Uh, this is sort of the main subject of my book. Uh, the, the ways that I've seen most often are pretty much uh, devoted friendship, uh, serving your community, serving others, and this would get to the idea of gifts that we can bring to the body of Christ. Eve's book, Gay and Catholic, Accepting My Sexuality, Finding Community, Living My Faith, from Ave Maria Press, was released today. Well, the CDC is beginning a new test procedure to help identify the recent outbreak of Enterovirus across the U.S. Catherine Elliott reports. 
The number of cases of a deadly respiratory virus affecting kids is expected to sharply rise in the coming days. That's because the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has come up with a new test for Enterovirus 68. The illness has sent a number of children to the hospital with breathing problems, even paralysis. When we start to uh, implement this test at CDC, we will be seeing a significant increase in the number of cases reported. This does not represent a change in the situation, but merely reflects the fact that we are catching up. Until now, the CDC has confirmed almost 700 cases across 46 states this year. The new test will help the government better understand the scope of the outbreak by clearing a backlog of specimens. The results won't necessarily show what's happening in real time. At the present time, we believe that the uh, number of cases is peaking or may have already peaked in a large part of the country. Mild enterovirus infections cause cold and flu-like symptoms, and it's spread by mucus and saliva. You want to wash your hands. You want to try to avoid contact with your eyes and mouth and nose. Doctors also warn that children with asthma may be more susceptible. Katherine Elliott, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, the man behind the film 40 discusses his investigation of the aftermath of legalized abortion in the U.S. Thanks for joining us on Wednesday, October 15th for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Three new recalls affect more than a million, or that would be 1.7 million, Toyota vehicles. The largest of the recalls involves brake problems, mostly on vehicles sold in Japan. Another includes more than 400,000 Lexus models sold here in the U.S. A fuel delivery line problem could ignite fires in models made between 2005 and 2010. Toyota is still reeling from the $1.2 billion fine connected to its 2010 recall of cars that accelerated unexpectedly, causing some accidents. More than 41 years after the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision, America remains sharply divided on the issue of abortion. The Pew Research Center say 54 percent of Americans think abortion should be legal in all or most cases. About 4 in 10 say it should be illegal. Those numbers haven't changed much for the past 20 years. John Morales is co-founder of Pro-Life Champions and director of 40, a pro-life documentary. There have been a lot of setbacks, John, but has the pro-life movement lost this battle? Brian, first of all, great to be with you. Without a doubt, it has not lost the battle. Uh, in fact, this struggle that's been going on now for 40 plus years is far from over. As, as we use in, in the old sports adage, it's not over till it's over. There are so many good reasons why the tide is turning and the pro-life movement is winning this battle for the culture of life. In fact, there have been major gains over these past several years. And with a younger generation stepping up, what do you think they'll contribute to the future of the pro-life movement? Without a doubt, the young people are not just the future of the pro-life movement, but the present as well. As good my point. good friend, Father Frank Pavone, has said so many times, and he said it in our film, because I think that these young people, in an in a intergenerational way, they understand that a third of their peers don't exist. And so they are, and they're committed to be the generation that will end ab abortion. So you are not only a post-abortive father, but you're also an adoptive father. How would you initiate conversations about abortion that have a chance of reaching people? So many times there's this wall that goes up when we bring this topic up. I think that there's power in stories. And when you yes. share from the heart with compassion and sensitivity and you listen carefully and you share your personal story, for me, for this reporter, um, I was involved in an abortion as a young man and um, I was young and dumb. And years later, uh, the Lord brought me back full circle uh, through uh, the miraculous uh, bringing of, of my adoptive son, Joseph Dominic, into this world. So Joseph, for me, has been the inspiration to spend three years of my life working on his documentary because he could have been one of the 57 million abortions, but his birth mother chose life. How sad that you have had this in your history, but doesn't it give you an opportunity to reach someone else in that position like I couldn't? because I did not have that experience. Absolutely, Brian, and, I, and I've had that opportunity to, to do so. And I think that more importantly, more than my own experience, I now have a tool, a very powerful and inspirational tool in, in our film, In 40, that I can give to someone, and I can hand the DVD to someone and say, here, watch this film, and you're gonna see not my perspective, 
but the perspective of over 40 national leaders and many men and women who have lived through the experience. Yeah, the DVD is 40. It's been out for a while, but it's certainly worth revisiting. What do you hope is accomplished through this project? Well, first of all, it's been out for about nine months uh, since last last uh, December 11th and um, so far we've already experienced tremendous fruits from the film we have touched hearts uh, we've inspired people we've motivated people and more so we've educated people on the importance of this issue on the the issue of the culture of life so I want to touch a, a whole generation of young people and really inspire them about the importance of, of this issue now, I know you did a lot of interviews and you did a lot of research that went into the production of 40. Did anything surprise you in that process? I think the scope and the magnitude and the variety of all the different leaders that we interviewed, everybody from uh, survivors of rape to women conceived in rape, women who have had as many as five abortions, uh, former abortionists, um, people who worked in Planned Parenthood and abortion clinics. We covered all different stripes and all different facets of the movement. What surprised me was how big this movement is and how committed the movement is to moving forward despite setbacks like what we've seen today. Yeah, you'll hear people say that, give it up, folks. You know, you've been at this for more than 40 years and abortion is still legal. What would you say to them? I would say that you never quit. You don't stop till it's over. We got to continue to persevere as a people of life. We got to continue to bring the truth to as many people as we can. We have to recognize that things have a way of changing. Who would have expected uh, the Berlin Wall to fall in dramatic fashion? I know I didn't. The way that it did 25 yeah. years ago, and yet it did. I dream and I, I, I pray for the day when abortion becomes as unthinkable as slavery is today. And of course, we're called to be faithful and success will come with that, hopefully. So uh, as we move forward, I'm sure we'll be seeing you at the March for Life. Uh, just give us a couple of ideas of some of the people that we might recognize, the faces, the voices that might, we might recognize from 40. Well, coming from sports, I like to call it an, a virtual all-star team of pro-life activists and leaders. Uh, Father Frank Pavone, uh, uh, Dr. Alveda King, uh, Ryan Bomberg, or Rebecca Kiesling, Lila Rose, uh, Jeannie Monahan from the March for Life. I mean, the, the list just goes on and on. And not only pro-life leaders, but we heard from the other side. We hear from women who are pro-choice, and we refute many of their typical arguments. We also hear from half a dozen women that used to work in Planned Parenthood and two former abortion doctors that, that are not as well known as some of these other names. But uh, altogether, it's been a tremendous blessing. The, the film has been unbelievably well received. It just came out on DVD just two days ago, and Ignatius Press is, uh, is handling uh, our, our work, our DVD, in the, in the Catholic market. John Morales, one quick question before we let you go. How has this work helped you to heal? Without a doubt. For, uh, for someone like myself that I was involved in an abortion, it has allowed me to understand the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our film, even though it's not a religious film, uh, there's no question that the Lord is in it and with it and because he is the truth, the way, and the life. And the so life. for me, it, it has been a tremendous source of healing. All right. From pro-life champions, John Morales, producer and director of 40. It's out now from Ignatius Press on DVD. Thanks for being with us, John. Thank you, Brian. We it's been a pleasure. It. Well, with a second spacewalk in two weeks, full power has now been restored to the International Space Station. A solar panel on the orbiting station has been down since spring. Today's work replaced a failed electrical unit, bringing energy capability back up to 100%. And that's good to have when you're in space. The two astronauts had a little bit of trouble with some bolts, but that didn't keep them from finishing their job in the allotted mission time with a few minutes to spare. And with Halloween approaching, NASA is releasing this amazing image of the sun. It looks like a, a jack-o'-lantern. Scary, but no cause for alarm. The bright spots forming the eyes, nose, and mouth are active regions on the sun. They're emitting more light and energy, so they show up brighter. The image captured by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, which watches the sun from its orbit in space. Well, until tomorrow, we encourage you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight. Good night and God bless you. Appreciate it.